Hi, it's me, Dr. V. I am back with another um, video on Science Essentials, and we're going to be talking about digestion essentials, all about the digestive system and its role in maintaining homeostasis and its role in our health. Okay, so the million dollar question of the day is why do we eat? You know, we can eat everything from pizza to vegetables to meat. You could just eat. All right, so everything that's living requires energy in order to survive. Now, your body can't just miraculously make energy out of nothing. So we have to actually bring in nutrients that can be converted to make energy. So here, if we take a look, we have food that will provide chemical energy later on. Um, we, from food, we have carbohydrates, fats, you have proteins. These things will actually get ingested, ingested and brought into the system. And at the end, then we have our energy production. Right, we do have some waste products that, that are produced, you know, called carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And also water, those are more metabolic waste products. All right, so let's take a look a little bit closer of what happens to the food that we eat. Because we know that food provides nutrients. And nutrients are very important for us to survive. So nutrients are essential for normal life function. So if we take a look here, um, the food that we eat, they are composed of proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. And lipids can contain triglycerides, fatty acids, and all those great stuff. Now, one thing I want to note is that after our body breaks down the nutrients that we eat, um, it can use the complex carbohydrates that we eat and break them down into smaller forms called glucose or other monomers like fructose. Um, and they can then be used to make energy or ATP. Cellular respiration is a whole nother thing. I'm not going to talk about cellular respiration in detail in this video. But I do also want to show you that proteins that we eat can be broken down into amino acids. And amino acids will get absorbed and they can be used to make protein. They could be used also as an alternate form of um, of energy that it can be used to produce ATP and then in the foods that we eat if they have lipids you can have triglycerides or fatty acids that we can see here form glycerol and fatty acids that can then go to either make more lipids or it can be used directly to make energy as another default mechanism or alternative form of making ATP um, so this is just showing you that the food that we eat ultimately is broken down to provide nutrients for our body to make either other structures or to make energy because every cellular process requires energy like enzymes, some molecules that need movement, you know, just a lot of different things. So the digestive system plays a critical role in providing that nutrient for your body. Let's look at an overview of the digestive system. Here we start off with the mouth. The mouth has several parts, um, the palate, the uvula, the tongue, and teeth. And the teeth is pretty much, we'll talk a little bit more about that for that uh, mechanical um, breakdown. Then we have the uh, pharynx, which is pretty much the mouth back re of the back of the throat region, sorry. Then we have our esophagus, which is also known as the food pipe. But before I get further than that, there are glands in your mouth that we'll talk about that produce saliva. These are salivary glands. We have sublingual, the, which is right here under the tongue. We have submandibular, and we have the parotid glands. All right, so if we take a look a little further down, after food passes through the esophagus, it'll enter into the stomach. And we'll talk about the different parts of the stomach and how the stomach plays a role in digestion. And then it transitions into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And the duodenum is important because you have accessory organs that will contribute to digestive enzymes such as the pancreas. And we also have the liver um, and the gallbladder. 
All right, so the small intestines have several parts, and we'll talk about those. And then this will then transition to the colon, right, where we have water absorption, and then the waste comes out. So we'll talk about the different parts. This is just an overview of the digestive system. So when food comes into the mouth, eventually the waste products of what's left over leaves as, you know, feces. Now this slide is really important because this slide discusses the enzymes. Enzymes play a role in chemical digestion of the food. I'll talk about mechanical breakdown a little bit, but I want to just focus on these enzymes. Now enzymes, they are very specific for what they break down. I, we, I did put out a video on discussing enzymes and how enzymes work. So if you want to go ahead and take a look, that will be great. It will help you understand why we're talking about enzymes now. All right, so this table discusses the enzymes, where the enzymes are produced, and where they're released. Now, I'm not going to really focus on the pH, but you can take a look at it if you want. All right, so carbohydrates, they're first digested in the mouth, and I'll talk about that in a second. So you'll have enzymes such as sal salivary amylase that are produced by the salivary glands in the mouth that will help start breaking down carbohydrates. There are other enzymes that break down carbohydrates. We have the pancreatic amylase. I'm sure you know where it's produced, the pancreas, because the name is in there. And they're actually secreted into the small intestine, particularly the duodenum that I mentioned. And then we have maltase that is actually produced by the small intestine, and they continue to digest the carbohydrate there. Now, protein digestion actually starts in the stomach. And there's gastric glands, I will talk about it, that will produce pepsin that will start the breakdown of protein. The pancreas will continue to, pro to produce other enzymes that can further digest proteins, and that's known as trypsin. And it is secreted into the small intestine, once again, the duodenum. And then peptidases are produced by the small intestine to further break down these protein products um, into smaller basic components so it can get absorbed by the small intestines. Now there are other um, enzymes involved in digestion that the pancreas produces and these are the ones that um, break down nucleic acids like the DNA and those things. They include nuclease and nucleosidases and they're secreted into the duodenum of the small intestines. And then we have fat digestion that's caused by lipase. Lipase is also produced by the pancreas, secreted into the small intestines, particularly the duodenal part. Now something that is not on here that the liver produces, that is not necessarily digestive, but more of a physical breakdown or mechanical breakdown, is bile. Right, and bile emulsifies fat, which I'll talk about in a second. So digestion, I said, start in the mouth. So the food goes in and you have teeth that can physically digest, like crush um, the food into smaller pieces. You have some teeth that play a role in, in tearing and some in grinding. I'm not going to go into detail about those, but they do break them down to smaller pieces. But I want to draw back to the salivary glands that we see here. So we have the sublingual, the submandibular, and the parotid salivary glands, and they play a role in starch digestion. All right, so when you get in maybe like a potato or rice or something of that nature, those type of carbohydrates, they get in, and in the saliva, you start the digestion of the carbohydrates. That will then get further digested um, when, you, when it goes down into your intestines. All right, so we see here, um, this is just a basic anatomy of the mouth. I'm not going to go into detail. But when you have that chewed up food with the saliva, that is now known as a bolus. Bolus. All right. That bolus has to go from the mouth into the stomach. So it will travel down this long muscular tube called the esophagus, also known as the food pipe. Now the question is, how does the food move? All right, so there is something called peristalsis. Peristalsis is the actual involuntary, so you can't think about it. 
you can't say, oh, food, move. It will just happen on its own through the use of smooth muscle being regulated by the nervous system. So peristalsis is the movement of food in the digestive tract. And this is just showing you how the food is propelled downward through peristalsis movement. You can see it here. It's more of a contraction rhythm that we see going on. Now this one, it will force the food to go into one direction. So if we're looking here, we see the bolus is actually, move, that's the food mixed with saliva, moving into the stomach. All right, so really quickly, um, just talk about the stomach a bit. Um, before I get to the anatomy, what is the function of the stomach? That's what I'm going to talk about. So the stomach first digests proteins. That's where we see it occur first. And it produces pepsin and hydrochloric acid. And I'll get to that in a second. But let's take a look at the anatomy. So this is where the esophagus would meet the stomach. Um, and there is, is a sphincter that would be found there to kind of prevent backflow. But it's not being shown here. So if we take a look at the, the big body outside of the stomach, we call that the fundus. The top part of the stomach, um, internally is the cardia. We have the body. Um, we have the inside, which contains the lumen. The lumen has these rouges in the mucosa, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. We have the antrum region, and then we have the pyloric canal leading to the sphincter. This is known as a pyloric sphincter. It is closed um, during the process of when the stomach is digesting the food. And then once it needs to be released, the sphincter opens and then it enters into the small intestine through the duodenum. We have a great curvature of the stomach and then we have a lesser curvature of the stomach. I do want to mention that there are several muscular layers to the stomach and I want you to notice um, the direction of the muscles that kind of gives that stomach the strength and the ability to really mix around the food. So the outer layer is a longitudinal layer. The middle layer is a circular layer. layer. You see how the striations are going you know, this direction. And then we have the oblique, oblique layer, which is more internally. All right, so this is the general structure of the stomach. But let's talk a little bit more about its actual properties. How does it actually digest? What's going on microscopically? Here I am actually zooming up on the internal mucosa of the stomach so you can see what's happening. So you know here's the stomach and when we zoom up we see our muscle layers that I mentioned is right here. We have our serosa. But this is the part that I find that I want to talk about because I find that it's one of the most you know important parts of the in the mucosal of the stomach. So in the stomach we have what's known as gastric glands. So here is a gastric gland and if we take a look at what's in the gastric gland, let's just zoom it up here, we see there are cells called the parietal cells and we have chief cells. Now these cells are actually important in the digestive because the gastric um, cells Actually, the gastric chief cells, to be specifically, play a role in, dige in digestion by producing a precursor enzyme called pepsinogen. All right, so these chief cells, the, the gastric chief, chief cells, produce pepsinogen. Pepsinogen becomes active in the presence of acid. So who produces the acid? Those are the parietal cells. All right, so the parietal cells will produce a hydrochloric acid that will give the pepsinogen that pH that it needs to become active, and the active form of pepsinogen is called pepsin. Okay, so the gastric chief cells, they produce the pepsinogen that becomes pepsin once it comes in contact with hydrochloric acid that is produced by the parietal cells. All right, so that's found in the stomach. Now, there are also um, mucus that's found in the stomach. I just want to mention that to help protect against the acid because the acid is pretty strong. So here we have our, just once again, we have our gastric pit. We have our gastric gland that we see here. 
And when we zoomed up on what's actually happened, the functional part, we have our chief cells and our parietal cells, and they're very important at producing pepsin and activating the pepsin or pepsinogen. Okay, so we know that protein is digested in the stomach. All right, so once we have digestion occurring, food further gets digested when it gets into the small intestines. So, you know, here we had food that was brought down through the esophagus into the stomach. And then from the stomach, it enters into the first part of the intestine called the duodenum, which we see here. Then we have our jejunum, which is the other part of the small intestine, and then the ileum. All right, so what actually goes on in the actual small intestine is really important, um, the function of the small intestine. One, it does produce enzymes to further digest food. So it produces maltase that could further digest those carbohydrates that was brought in. And it also produces peptidase, which will further break down proteins. Now, another important thing, especially that duodenum, because I've mentioned it before, is that the duodenum can receive the enzymes produced by the accessory organs. The accessory organs include the liver, the pancreas, and what's associated with the liver is the gallbladder. Okay, So liver and gallbladder, I'll talk about it together. So once again, our um, accessory organs are the pancreas, and liver slash gallbladder, okay? So when the pancreas, which produces a whole host of enzymes, secretes it into duodenum, that will further cause digestion. So we have pancreatic amylase, we have trypsin, nuclease, and lipases that are produced by the pancreas that gets dumped into duodenum. And then we have our bile, which is more of a fat emulsifier, like break down the fat, that also gets dumped into the duodenum. So digestion continues, but another thing that I want you to know is that once the digestion has been completed, the nutrients are actually absorbed in the small intestines. So we had all this chemical breakdown, this chemical digestion, but it's important for you to know that the nutrients get absorbed in the small intestines. Okay, so how does nutrients actually get absorbed in the small intestines? So here we're looking at um, the enterocytes or cells that are in your intestines, and they have projections called villus or villi that we see here. Each villi has these smaller portions called microvilli. Now the villi and the microvilli play a role in increasing absorption area so you can absorb in more of the nutrients. So you could take a look how they look here. And if we take a look further at the villus, so here's a villus um, that contains, although it's not showing here, the microvilli. You know, that's a if we zoom up off the intestines, that's what we see. Um, I do want to mention that the microvilli are part of what we call the brush border. Inside of the villi, after the nutrients are being brought in um, through the microvilli, there are um, capillaries that can actually take in and absorb the nutrients. And that can then be gone into the system. I'll discuss that later, how that happens. So the nutrients can be used by the body. But I do want to mention that these green structures are known as lacteals. It's part of the lymphatic system. And it brings in the lipids. The lipids do not go directly into the capillaries. So it has to be brought in um, through a different route, through the lymphatics. So if we take a look here, this is what actually happens. So here we have our villi that I was talking to you before. So that food that we ate, um, it comes in, you know, we have our products that have been broken down um, into amino acids or carbohydrates or the fatty acids. They have to get absorbed. So through the villus, you know, we had a little microvilli on the surface. The nutrients will be brought in and then it can actually go into circulation, it'll go through the liver, and then it'll get dumped into the subclavian vein, and then that will be brought through the system. We have our lipids, remember, brought in through the lymphatics, through the lacteals. We have the chylomicrons that will actually help to transport these lipids to the lymphatics, and then gets into the venous system through, once again, the left subclavian vein. So this is showing you how the food enters gets absorbed and how it actually that nutrients gets brought into the system. 
Okay, so now the food has passed that small intestine. The nutrients have been absorbed into your system. It has been dumped into that subclavian vein and is going about through the system to provide nutrients for your cells. Great. So what happens next? Right, the next step is the large intestine known as the colon. And we have different parts of it. We have our ascending colon. We have our transverse colon. This is all part of one, but they're different parts. We have our descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then we have the um, rectum and the anus. Now, what occurs in this large intestine? Before I get to that, Everything that have gone through the small intest intestines have been mixed in with enzymes. The, the food has pretty much been liquefied. So it's a lot of liquid. And we have a lot of water that's in there. The water has to get reabsorbed. And we need water. So the water reabsorption occurs in the colon. I want to mention to you, no digestion occurs in the colon. There is no digestion occurring in the colon. Everything has already been broken down. What has to happen is water absorption. So when you go to the bathroom and do number two, it's not necessarily liquidy because the colon has done its job. If you've had, let's say, an encounter with a bad bacteria like salmonella um, that may trigger diarrhea, the reason why it comes out liquidy is because your body's trying to eliminate it, so it's the it's moving really fast to the colon and hasn't had a chance to get the water absorbed. So water absor absorption occurs in the colon. So what are some things that can go wrong with the digestive system? So I'm just going to talk about two things um, that we see that is a problem or, and a growing problem um, in our society. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease is GERD. And it's, what that is, is pretty much like heartburn on steroids. And like someone asked me in class, you know, why is heartburn called heartburn? Is it really affecting your heart? Well, not necessarily. What's happening is that, you remember we have the sphincter that's between the esophagus and the stomach? It stays closed so these digestive juices don't go back into your esophagus. But what we see in GERD or in heartburn is that we see that sphincter opens. It may be weak or it may just may be opening or irritated and open up. And those digestive juices starts moving up into the esophagus, causing a burning sensation. Now, I will tell you that, remember, we have hydrochloric acid that is being produced in the stomach. And HCL is very, very potent. So that burning is from the hydrochloric acid. Now, if it's occasional... Um, heartburn that you get, okay, it's just maybe, you know, bothering you for a short period of time. But someone that gets chronic heartburn that's constantly happening, that can pose a problem with the esophagus. It can, those acids and digestive juices can actually erode away at the esophagus, causing issues um, later on. So GERD is something that needs to be kept under control. They could be given antacids as well as other things to prevent um, that backflow and damage to the esophagus. Now another one is celiac disease. Celiac disease is really um, an immune attack um, where the, the intestinal cells actually get caught in the crossfire. So what do I mean? People that have... Um, celiac disease, they can't eat certain types of food. Like they can't eat wheat, they can't eat pastas, anything with that. And the crazy thing about it is that almost everything, even though it's not directly wheat, can have some modified form of wheat in it. And because of that, people with celiac disease have to really be careful what they eat when they go to the restaurant. You may have some seasoned salt that may have some very form of wheat in it. You know, soy sauce may have wheat in it. So there's a lot of things that people with celiac disease have to watch out for. So what does celiac disease do? Well, their immune system um, is really having a reaction to the wheat or the gluten that they're eating. 
And what we see here, I just want to just bring you down here. We have our white blood cells that are coming in because if you're eating things that are your body's not agreeing with regarding wheat, if you have celiac disease, the white blood cell will come in and notice what happens. So initially, before the white blood cell has taken root, your villi looks great. Okay, you see that? Nice. We have our microvilli there that can work properly. But when you look, as time goes on, we see that there is atrophying of the villi or breakdown of the villi. And this is not a good thing because now, how is your food going to get absorbed? How is your nutrients going to get absorbed? So some people with celiac disease can develop malabsorption syndrome because their villi is not going to work properly. So celiac disease is actually a serious thing going on. Um, and people that have it have to take it really seriously. All right, so that was a lot of stuff. Let's see what you remember. It's quiz time. All right, first question. Digestion starts in the... All right, so choices are stomach, small intestine, large intestine, mouth, or blood. Well, we clearly we know it's not blood. I just tried to throw something in there. So hopefully you said mouth because remember digestion of carbohydrates start in your mouth because your salivary glands produces saliva that contains salivary amylase and that's what breaks down carbohydrates. Accessory organs of the digestive system includes select all that applies stomach, pancreas, liver, colon. All right, so accessory, those include pancreas and liver. Remember, the pancreas produces a whole lot of enzymes that are really essential at breaking down fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Liver now um, produces bile, and bile helps emulsify or break down fat. Which enzyme or enzymes digest? Proteins, so select all that applies. I have amylase, maltase, nuclease, trypsin, and peptidase. Let's see. All right, so if you pick trypsin and pep peptidase, you are correct. Those enzymes help digest proteins. Which enzyme or digests or digests carbohydrates? Select all that applies. So we know we already spoke about trypsin and peptidase, so you can just take that out of the rotation, right? But we have amylase, maltase, and nuclease, so which ones? If you selected amylase and maltase, you are correct. Those play a role in digesting carbohydrates, not nuclease. Nuclease plays a role in breaking down um, nucleic acids like DNA. Microvilli for nutrient absorption is found. Where is that found? Stomach, colon, small intestine, pancreas, or mouth. All right, so where are the microvilli found? If you said small intestines, you are correct. You remember, the microvilli has capillaries on the inside that when the nutrients comes through, the capillary can take it and can actually bring it to the liver, it can get, then go into the veins and go into circulation. And you remember the microvilli also have lacteals, which are part of the lymphatic system that can help bring in the lipids that were digested that can then get brought into circulation through the veins. So microvilli are very important. Next one, water absorption occurs in the, is it stomach, colon, small intestine, pancreas, or mouth. Any wild guesses? If you said colon, you are right. Remember, digestion does not occur in the colon. Everything has already been digested because you, the colon, its only role is really to absorb the water, right? Remember, most of the digestion or digestion ends in the small intestines, right? We have end of digestion and absorption of nutrients. So water absor absorption occurs in the colon. So hopefully you got 100% on the quiz. Um, if you didn't, please go back and look at it. There are really important concepts that we discussed from that physical mechanical breakdown from teeth all the way to chemical breakdown where digestion starts into the mouth and digestion continues into the small intestines. You know, we had that propulsion of bolus, that's the food in the mouth mixed with saliva 
that moves through peristalsis and all the movement in the digestive tract is through peristalsis. So go ahead and look back at the video if you did not get 100, but just let me know how you did and what you learned. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, bye.